Okay, welcome everybody uh, to the uh, insurance committee meeting of Thursday, March 18th. Uh, we have a call to order, uh, public comment. I don't see anybody with the public comment, so we'll move along. Minutes, approve the minutes of uh, February 18th, 2021. Uh, let me, has everybody read it? Yeah, I approve, I move to approve. No second. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody that passes. Okay, let's go to reports from the brokers. Looks like uh, Christopher Walthrop is up for up number one today. Chris, take it away. Thank you very much. And uh, earlier today, I had a, a little bit of buffering with my, my tech system here. So hopefully things will, will go according to plan. If not, we can swap over to Mr. Monroe. He's ready. Um, He's in the bullpen. He's ready to go. All right. So, so with uh, 1A, insurance budget and renewal update, <clears throat> I just wanted to give you a little bit of a feel for this one. So as we've said over the last few months, there's this March towards July 1st, and there's a major period of time where we're helping Mike with budget and insurance cost forecasting. Uh, so that continues. Now, last month, we were able to negotiate um, a, a renewal for your crime insurance. And this is what's known as employee dishonesty coverage. There's coverage for forgery claims and, and other types of, of claims. And um, that's actually, uh, so it renews in March. It's a coverage area that has seen a little bit more heat to it over the past few years with municipalities due to social engineering claims. Um, there have been some other types of claims. And this has been a sleepy coverage area um, that, that really has not had a whole lot of attention. The good news is we were able to get it renewed for re really no increase in premium, which was actually a little bit less than I thought would be the case. So I give a little credit to my colleague, Kathy Crooker, who's not on the line here, um, but we we're very pleased, you know, small item, but all the little items add up, right? So, yeah. so that was good. As far as um, the rest of the program, obviously the largest costs lie with the Kerma lap package policy, as well as the workers' comp policy. We're continuing to monitor not just the Connecticut municipal insurance marketplace, but regionally and nationally. And the, the budget change is primarily in the zero to kind of low, you know, single digit variety for rate change. And comparing that to what the benchmarks are with a number of the stock insurance carriers, you're probably a good three to 10% below what the averages are with some of the other carriers. And in some of the stock carriers, and I was at a, an, I'm part of a national carrier council last Thursday, the, the level of attention that they are giving to, you know, kind of like protecting with larger rate increases thinking that law enforcement uh, reform is going to lead to increased litigation. They're seeing just increased settlements in litigation on slip fall claims, employment related claims, uh, auto claims. They're, they're very, very nervous about what they think they'll see. So when we look at some of the decisions that were made in terms of partnering with KERMA, supporting KERMA, continuing with the, the multi-year budget stabilization agreement. These were smart moves. We, we knew they were gonna be a smart move, but we're seeing the evidence of that right now. So, so right now we're in a good position, but at the same time, what we're doing, um, and, and Ashley would say this too, um, over the next 60 days, there will be some more review of you know, the claims experience, the risk management practices, and then in the month of May, after you know, a review of the April claim results for the LAP and the, and the workers' comp, Kerma will do a final review to say, okay, were the initial indications that were rendered still accurate? Is there any extra room um, at that point? And then at that point, we'll be asking again, even the member equity distribution program, will it continue? And this is kind of like a dividend. It's not based on claims or anything. But this is Kerma looking at their financials, looking at the members, rewarding 
you know, um, loyalty and that type of a thing. So we'll be asking again about that. Last year, it was 2% of your last full year's premium between lap and workers' comp. And that can, that can be a measurable amount. The year before, it was 5.3. And the year before that, it was 5. So um, Mike and I, we haven't even actually talked about that within the last week or so, but it's something that we are taking a look at. So <clears throat> those are two things. Um, another area is the standalone cyber coverage, okay? This continues to be a major, major uh, initiative. And at this point, Mike, Matt, myself, Kathy Crooker, we are exploring legitimate programs. We're going through an application process. Um, we're, we're basically helping to evaluate what are the risk management you know, procedures like multi-factor authentication that we know the underwriters will want. And then we're also working side by side with Kerma because they have a relationship with another program that can offer some standalone coverage. Um, again, that's going through the underwriting process at this point. So um, there will be more news to share. We'll probably give updates each month leading to June. And then in June, we'll probably have a whole lot more data on uh, where things stand. So standalone cyber, it's a big deal. The last thing regarding the you know, renewal update part is in the next 30 days, the schedules of property, autos, and equipment will come out from Kerma. And this is an annual process to make sure that we have the list proper. But at this point, well, what we're going to do again, and we're doing this with our clients, we're going to look at different locations and just say to ourselves, is if there's no contents coverage on a building, like a salt shed or another building, should there be? Is, is any of the coverage greater than it should be? Uh, because things do change, inventory changes, building use changes. So Matt, Mike, and I know about that. So we'll be looking at that, okay? So that's more of a report about 1A, insurance budget and renewal update. Any questions so far? No, that's good. Thanks. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say, um, and Matt Kazaki, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when um, the superintendent was giving the um, his report on Tuesday night or Monday night, and he was talking about um, the, you know, about IT. And he said that, um, that I'm assuming it was the town, but there are like 5,000, uh, you know, attempted hits um, on our system alone a day, wow. um, which I, I was just, I mean, I think everybody who was listening because some uh, somebody actually did ask him to clarify that, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Is no, it? that was correct. Five thousand. I'm assuming because IT is shared services and it's one platform that it would be the town and the board combined. Right, right. But that was a, that was a daily figure. But I mean, you know, when we're talking about the cyber exposure, I, I was I was shocked when I I mean when I was on the on the board, I had a lot of emails that obviously weren't um uh you know weren't valid but i'm i was really surprised to hear that no you know that much bombardment that uh um our systems are getting so yeah it's 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 literally poly it's a global phenomenon you know and, and the criminal enterprises they are well financed and they're very sophisticated um, you may have heard of the solar winds breach that happened nationally that's made mm -hmm. headlines. Um, it's now actually a question that underwriters ask. They say, hey, does a municipality use software that comes from SolarWinds, or, which is an Orion company out of Texas? Um, but that, that actually leads to another set of questions in services. Underwriters are asking questions about those types of things um, in terms of what type of, you know, do you have your firewalls? Do you have backup integrity and other things like that? But what we're doing is we've always been very, very strong working with our clients in what we call vendor supplier risk management. And that gets into contract language. Uh, it gets into creating buffers. And, and I know Paul Mead knows this very, very well and, and uh, Greg as well, that we what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that if the town or the school district is responsible for something, that's great. But if a vendor, a supplier, even a national software company 
if they're responsible for something where you incur costs or you're dragged into a lawsuit, they need to be held responsible. So we're continuing to look at insurance requirements and in cases where we can include cyber insurance requirements, include language there where it requires the vendor to be responsible for data breach notification and meeting Connecticut laws. So these are some really important areas to focus in. So uh, more to follow on that, but that's more on the risk management side of uh, what we're doing, okay? Thanks. Any other questions on that? All right, so under 1B, other risk management in, in insurance activities, one of the first things, and, and, and Ashley and I had talked about this and she, pre she prepared an exhibit for Mike and Matt um, that we looked at, and it's similar to ones that you've seen, you know, historically, but what we like to do at this point, you know, we've gotten into 2021, how does the current year look in terms of your overall losses? And without going into any specific detail, the current year, as of February 28th, on the LAP, so the liability auto and property side, things are looking very, very good from several different angles. Uh, the amount of claims in dollars and number for the town is much, much lower than your average. And I would say the same holds true for the school district. So I won't give you numbers, but if you were to measure the total incurred dollars for the current year against the total annual premiums, it's actually in a very favorable place right now. The current year is green, okay? It takes a long time for those numbers to solidify. Um, but that's a good, it, it's, you know, you can control what you can control and things are good in that sense, okay? Now, when I move over to the workers' compensation side, and if I had some pieces of paper and we were in person, I'd probably share some information, but it's a similar story, okay? Now, workers' comp has a, a pretty distinct tail um, where it takes a long time for the numbers to, to solidify, but in your case, um, when we look at the total premiums, your loss ratios are under 20% so far uh, compared to your total annual premium. And, you know, I think it's public, your total annual premium is, is over 800,000. So, um, so that's also a good story. Your claim counts are down. I think in part, especially in the school district side, you know, claim count as well as dollars will be down because of the COVID environment where it's really reduced the amount of activities with paraprofessionals and students and things like that. Welcome Chairman Frank Cena too. I was painting. I got away. <laughs> right. I haven't painting even washed yourself. up. Time got away from me. No problem. You know, here we are painting a picture of the insurance and uh, you're clearly uh, doing uh, exactly that. Clever, clever. I like it. So I, I apologize. I just, right. time doesn't, days don't exist. Time doesn't exist. So. <laughs> I apologize. Oh, no problem. So, Frank, you got to do it again. I assume our vice chairman has assumed command. Assumed, and I will relinquish. No, 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 no. It's good training for when we switch over. <laughs> so, a couple. Uh, so, that's just really a high level look at losses. So, nothing much more to report. Um, but I will say that within the next two months, we'll be looking at the largest open claims to see what is the status? Is there any strategy that can be used that might be a little bit different and better that will allow us to show a better outcome, perhaps at a lower dollar cost? And then when that final review happens with the, you know, the rates and all that, we can be assured that it's the best possible picture at that point in time. So two other things. One, we're continuing to monitor just different types of legislation and reform. Um, we, we've talked, in the past about just police reform. We have the police accountability legislation here in Connecticut. It, there are different provisions in that legislation that take effect in 2021. So one of the provisions, for example, is that municipalities may establish civilian review boards, okay? So when we look at that, we say, okay, if that's kind of like a committee, what are their responsibilities going to be? And you know what type of training might they need? And lastly, what um, what are the coverage implications? We want to make sure, as your kind of advisors, that the proper level of coverage is in place. 
And if we need to make changes, we make changes, but it's just, it's an example of each year is a different year. And, um, you know, obviously with this legislation, you know, many people don't know what the impact will be on the legal environment for at least one, two, three years from now. Um, but, but that, you know, we've reviewed the legislation and that was one area that uh, we're taking a look at. And, you know, some of it, like I said, it comes into play later on this year. So we'll take a look at that. Yes. Yeah. Is there a model legislation by which the state of Connecticut or the town could go by? Uh, it's such a complicated question. I'm not quite sure I could actually answer that one. Um, uh, yes, I, no. I, what's that? Yes, there is. No, there isn't. I don't know if there there actually is. Um, you know, I know when, you know, in terms of model legislation, last fall, when the language was coming out, there was a lot of conjecture. It was a very fast pace um, that was taken before it was actually passed. And there were a number of people that said that there was a conflict between, you know, federal law and state law. So in many ways, I, I, I really don't know the answer to that one right now. I wish okay. I could answer your question. Uh, Mike, is, is there, are you aware of anything on the town council or the, uh, uh, the managers, town managers um, um, office that suggested something might like being considered so we can prepare. Not that I'm aware of, Frank. Yeah, and if we hear more, Frank, we'll certainly we'll cascade that out. Um, you know, I would imagine as we get through the springtime into the summer, when some of the key provisions of the legislation go into effect, we will probably see more on that subject. So I would say more to follow there, okay? And then the, la the last piece uh, that I'll just mention is just, it's, it's more in a way of like long-term planning. And, and as we take a look at the, the current structure of your liability insurance and your workers' compensation insurance, <clears throat> one of the things, and my colleague Chris Monroe knows this too, we talk about something called the risk continuum. And, uh, you know, would it make sense as we look at, say, the liability coverage, the workers' compensation coverage, would it make sense to take on different levels of risk for different retention, like workers' comp, for instance? Would it make sense to explore a large deductible program or full self-insurance? So, you know, as we look at the premiums getting to certain levels and we look at internal risk management practices, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea to look down the road and say, okay, maybe not for the next fiscal year or even the following fiscal year, but what if we were to overlay what a different retention structure would look like compared to your current program? And this is looking at literally 10 years worth of claims experience. We have some analytics specialists at USI now on our property casualty side that can help us do these types of um, these types of projects. So uh, it's not something that we've really talked about, um, but it's something that as we go year to year and the budget has so much pressure on it that we have to be innovative. We have to be thinking a little bit outside the box. And um, with what we're seeing in Connecticut and around the country with some of the ideas my colleagues have, it's something that I mentioned to Mike and uh, Matt and um, you know slowly, we'll be looking to explore what could be potentially be like alternative type um, structures. Not saying we're moving away from what you have, but we wanna look at some qualified alternatives. And uh, if it unlocks some savings or is a way to, in a smart way, reduce expenses, um, then that's, uh, that's something we wanna explore further for you. Okay. So any questions? That was good, my friend. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Mead, like I said, I'll talk with you afterwards. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> Good. All right, Mr. Monroe, you all there? Oh, ready to go? I am ready to go. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, a couple of things um, from my side of the desk, if you will. Um, wanted to touch upon uh, two of the things we typically tackle tackle every month and then wanted to bring everybody in the loop in terms of a, a meeting that we have scheduled for tomorrow morning with the town and the board. Um, as far as the stuff that we typically tackle, I wanted to first start with 
the monthly claim liability report. Um, we have eight months under our belt. We've got claims through the month of February. Um, as you peruse that report, you will see that we're sitting on a pretty uh, substantive uh, plan year surplus. Um, we have seen very solid performance relative to budget. And sitting where we are at this point in time does yield a very good year for Weathersfield. Now we still have to get through March, April, May, June, but there's nothing that I have seen uh, on the horizon that would support a deterioration uh, in comparison to the months that we have year to date. So at this point, you know, we're in great shape. If you look at our history, generally by the time we get six, seven months under our belt, um, that generally uh, is a point in time where we can make the statement whether we're having a good year or a bad year. Um, had a good year last year, and I believe we're gonna have an equally good, if not better year this year. Right. So solid, solid plan performance year to date. Okay. Yeah, we're happy with that, I'm sure. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, no, it's, you know, it's, you know, so goes large claims, Greg, so goes the year. Mm -hmm. And we've yep. seen um, large claim activity over the last 18 months calm down, if you will, um, versus what we had seen in, in prior, prior years. Um, so that is based upon where we are year to date. Now that obviously is going to influence what we expect to see from a renewal standpoint in July. Um, I did include a secondary report that does update the renewal projection based upon claim activity through the month of February. Um, when it comes to setting our budget, um, there's really two moving pieces when it comes to that overall cost basis. Um, we have uh, what we call our fixed costs. So what are we paying Blue Cross to manage the plan? Um, what are we paying the captive to cover us from a stop loss standpoint? What do we expect to get back from Blue Cross in the form of RX rebates? And when you look at that area of our cost basis, um, in my modeling around the renewal, I kind of made the assumption that it's going to be unchanged. The reality is we're going to be able to peel a fair amount of cost out of the admin piece based upon some reductions in our admin charges, based upon an increase in our rebate share. Um, the only kind of missing piece is what we think we'll see from the captive stop loss wise. Um, I modeled in a 15% increase. Um, I am for the lack of a better word, hounding John, Har John Hardy at Gallagher every day about where we are with early numbers around the captive. And my counsel to John, and it's more in support of another client of mine who's in the captive, is, hey, we're pushing April. We've got a lockdown budgets. You're getting pressed by the incumbent carrier on what they're trying to do in taking that business back. You got to give us something. But, you know, for purposes of this conversation, I've modeled in a 15% increase to the stop loss, okay? So that's one piece, and that's one piece of good news. You know, to say back to you um, in a very summarized version, the fixed cost component is gonna come down. Um, a rising tide raises all boats because of our claims being so strong performance-wise, um, that is going to have a material impact in terms of where we think claims are going for the upcoming plan year. Um, in the projection that we're modeling through, 
Um, we are folks conservative in the underwriting assumptions that we've applied. Um, we've applied a very healthy COVID adjustment, healthy to the tune of around $850,000. Right. We are applying Blue Cross's published book of business trend factors. Our history is such that we trend lower than Blue Cross's book of business. I didn't build in a Weathersfield specific trend adjustment. I went with the more conservative Blue Cross trend number. I've made no aggressive adjustment around large claims. In our most recent 12 months, we had six claims over 150,000. Our prior history supported six to eight. I built in eight. So one can argue that on a $150,000 pooling point, two additional large claims, we've modeled in $300,000 in additional claim cushion. Even with all of those adjustments, we're projecting roughly a 6% reduction in our claim spend. So when you folks kind of roll it all up and you look at what we're projecting for the upcoming year versus what we have for the current year, you're looking at around a five, 6% reduction in cost. That translates into about $700,000. However, here's the big roadblock that we have to stop for. Um, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we well reserved when it comes to our reserve liabilities on the account? You know, and what do I mean by that? Do we have the right incurred but not reported reserve on our books? Do we have the proper claim liability reserve on our books, i.e. the proverbial rainy day fund? If claims move against us, have we put enough of a claim cushion aside to handle that uptick if it emerges? Um, we had a couple of years back where we blew through the budget. Um, we needed to tap that reserve. Well, are we adequately re-reserved, if you will, um, what about the OPEB liability for our retirees? So before we go out and start um, reducing the budget by 700,000, we have to make sure we're well reserved. So I don't want the message to be, hey, the costs are going down. I want the message to be, we're having a good year. There's evidence to support the costs going down, but we need to be cognizant of making sure before we reduce that budget, uh, we're well reserved in other areas. Let me stop here and open the floor up to questions. Okay. There you go. Um, um, you know, it, it makes sense. Okay. I mean, it does make sense. It, it, it just plain makes sense. It's, 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 it's a, it's a, I think yeah. a conservative way to approach it. I mean, like, you know, the commander doesn't want to surprise it. So, and, and, and in fairness, you know, we still have to get through March, April, May, June. You know, things go south, and we've already locked down the budget. Then guess what? We're kind of tied to that budget. So, um, again, I think that the order of the day is to. Um, you know, not reduce it until we address those reserving questions. And, uh, but we're in very good shape or no wise. Right. Um, everything that I've served up to you is based upon the status quo. And the status quo is <clears throat> rooted in a carrier relationship with Anthem and a stop loss relationship with the captain. Um, we have struggled in our relationship with Anthem. Um, the struggle has intensified over the last two or three months because of some systems conversions that they're going through. Aww. 
but it is very much a hourly existence for me to get an email from somebody at Weathersfield, whether it's on the town or the board side about another continued problem with Anthem. Um, people can't verify coverage. Um, retirees aren't getting their claims paid. The way the plan was adjudicated in the past has changed. People can't verify coverage. The RID cards are wrong. So it's a, it's a challenge, very much a challenge. Um, as you folks know, um, we never really stopped our marketing efforts that kicked off um, January 2020. Um, we've just kind of kept that train moving down the track. The meeting tomorrow with the town and the board is to go through the marketing results. The marketing results, in essence, point to the following path forward. Um, there's strong support from where I sit to consider ending the relationship with Blue Cross. Partnering up with Cigna to serve as our claims administrator. Right. Um, keeping the captive in place as our stop loss provider. Putting in place express scripts as our pharmacy benefit manager. So we've kind of gone from an environment where um, two pieces of the pie were managed by Anthem and the captive. We're now going to kind of a three piece of the pie, if you will, where you have Cigna serving as the medical administrator, Express Scripts managing the pharmacy and the captive uh, managing the stop loss. When you look at the estimated savings over a three year period from a fixed cost standpoint, you're looking at around a half a million dollars over three years. Now, if you pull into that discussion, um, Express Scripts and a repricing exercise that they did on the pharmacy claims, um, that is expected to yield an additional 100,000 in savings annually. So you can argue that the combination of the fixed cost coupled with this better pricing arrangement on the pharmacy claim side um, could inflate that savings from 500 to 800,000 over the next three years. But what it also does folks is in some measure, um, it gives us a fresh bite at the apple when it comes to a carrier that uh, I feel uh, might have a little bit stronger customer service commitment than we've seen out of Anthem for the last year. That's a pretty big move. Yep, yep. Now, if you were a private sector employer, then the discussion evolves between myself, the CEO, the CFO, and the HR director. And that group of three, yays or nays, and then we move on. Um, but that's not us. Um, we have bargained agreements that need to be considered. So the meeting tomorrow is based upon the town and board going through the numbers and saying, is there enough here to move forward? And if the answer is yes, then that becomes hurdle one that we've cleared. But then we have to engage the unions. Um, we have pulled together what is called a disruption report where we've looked at the 2,600 physicians or facilities that our people have utilized. And from that report, we're able to say, in moving this business to Cigna, you're essentially able to replicate the provider access that you now have through Blue Cross. So 
Joanne is not going to have to worry about losing her access to the providers that she sees today. Greg is not going to have to worry about the pharmacies that he sees today and, and, and loss of that access. That's what the disruption report yields. Um, what I typically do in my disruption reports is I start by looking every single provider. <clears throat> and that's going to capture your chiropractors, your family practitioners, your oncologist, all the hot, every single provider that flows under that. But I think what I also adds value is we then create a subset where we look at mental health providers. Um, I have no problem standing in front of somebody and saying, you might have to change your pediatrician. It's not an easy message, but there's a whole lot of pediatricians out there. Um, I don't have a problem saying to somebody, hey, the chiropractor you go to, you might have to find a new one. It's very difficult to say that to somebody when it's a behavioral health issue. Mm -hmm. um, you find as an industry that from a behavioral health standpoint, whether it's Anthem, Cigna, Aetna, United, um, you find a lot of behavioral health physicians who are unwilling to join those networks. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that they're bare bones. They're not. But you have a lot of instances where those folks say, I don't have to join the network. I know that I provide such a service to you or your child or what have you, you'll pay me out of network if I don't belong to those carriers. So I don't wanna deal with the hassle of Cigna, Aetna. If you wanna see me, I'd love to see you and you're just gonna pay me direct. That's just the nature of how that area of the business works. But we have to be cognizant of it. And the results from Cigna are good. Um, there are about 18, 20 behavioral health providers that fall out. And I've said to Cigna, we have to come up with some solution on a chunk of these, because again, it's sensitive. And you have people that struggle to find the right behavioral health professional, and you really don't want to disrupt that if you, if, if you can avoid it. So that's one of the things that we'll ultimately have to kind of share with the union, rightfully so and make them aware of what's going on. The last thing we'll share with the union is a formulary disruption report. And it's essentially me going through and saying, hey, the town of Wethersfield generated 22,000 scripts in the 2020 plan year or calendar year. And guess what? Of those scripts, 98.5% are also on the Express Scripts formula. And the 1.5% that are not, here are those 300 scripts that comprise 30 drugs. Hate to say this to you folks, but those are the drugs that come off the formulary. That's not disruptive. The union cannot say that's disruptive. If it was 10% of the drugs coming off, that's disruptive. But the second hurdle that we have to clear is we have to get the unions to feel comfortable with this. Doesn't mean they can tell us no. It just means that you want to avoid a grievance and you want to be able to make them part of the process if you can. And that's what we're going to be tackling tomorrow if there is that, um, that incentive to move forward based upon that half a million. I'm going to make one more statement, uh, statement and then I'll shut my yapper on this. Um, Anthem is still not out of the game. Um, Anthem is making a hard push to stay in the game and the way they're doing it is by going after the captive from a stop loss standpoint. They're going after the captive and undercutting that rate. Now Anthem will tell you they're not undercutting the rate and there's some plausibility in what they're saying. What they're saying is we're floating the same rate we floated to Weathersfield for the last two years. And that to us shows our commitment where that rate doesn't change, debatable. But they're making a push. In the Anthem world, the savings would be 650,000 over the three years. But candidly, folks, I, I, I just don't think they've earned the right to stay in place. And I don't wanna minimize 150,000 over three years, but you know, paying a $50,000 additional cost to find yourself with the right premium on a $10 million line item, 
that's money that the town and board should rightfully spend. Because again, candidly, I don't think at Anthem as of late has earned the business, whether it's the last three months or kind of one of the uh, levers that they pulled last year to prevent us from carving out the pharmacy. Wow. Is there a building? What's that? Uh, do we have the ability to drill down in uh, pediatric claims to the same degree that we do for behavioral claims? To me, that's as big an issue, if not bigger, for you know uh, employees who have children uh, who are still seeing pediatricians. Uh, can we drill down and see how big a deal that is? Is this on the behavioral health side? Right? Well, you said behavioral, and then you said uh, pediatrics, pediatricians. We, we, we can. So I have this, and I'll, I'll pull it up for you so you can see exactly. Let me just let me see exactly what, uh, what I'm referencing. But the answer is yes. You know, we would give the union this Excel file. <clears throat> and they can sort it by whatever discipline they want to see. So they'd be able to go in and say, I want to look at OBs. I want to look at pediatricians. I want to look at um, any particular discipline. And again, let me show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, all right, so I'm going to put this thing up now. Hold on here. So let me know when you can see my screen. Okay, there you go. It's on my yeah. screen, but whether I can see it or not, I think I need trifocals. Yeah, oh. no, you're going to, this is going to, you're going to have to really put the readers on for this one. But let me just go to the top and give you a little feel for how I set it up. And again, it's 2,600 lines. So it's, uh, I always start by where are we spending the majority of our money? Yeah. So you sort it by dollars spent. So, you know, you should see Hartford Hospital, right? No surprise. Yeah. So for the 2000, for this period of time, December 19th through November 20th, um, we spent 1.7 million at Hartford Hospital. That was made up of 2,178 services. There was 181 members. Their par, which is participating with Anthem. Yeah. And they're participating with Cigna. Huh. So when you look at the top 25, they're all in the network. And these are mostly hospitals as you can see. Yeah. But my point, Frank, is if somebody wanted to say, all right, this is great, they can sort this thing by hospital, emergency room. I see that. Pathology. You can just yeah. set it up any way you want, put in yeah. a couple of tables, and you yep. can look at it. On the behavioral health side, this is where I kind of went in here, and I sorted it by, you know, here's a problem right here with Cigna, right? Yeah, uh, this this provider in Glastonbury, licensed clinical social worker, not a lot of dollars spent, 35 services, um, one member. So again, as much as I say a problem, you're impacting one person. And again, I don't want to minimize that one person. Yeah. But the you know, this is the level of detail that you know we want to give the unions to say, folks, there's no disruption. Now again. We have to close the gap because I shared this report with Cigna and I said, all right, here's the deal. We saw 161 behavioral health specialists, nine are out of your network anthem. Well, guess what? Under Cigna, it's 26. We got to close that gap a little bit. We got to find a way to get some of those providers back into the Cigna network. But that's kind of the level of detail. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's really, really, really good stuff. Yeah. Good. So we embark on that tomorrow. How do you present that, Chris? How, how do you get, get in front of the union and say, 
this is our plan and, and yeah. let's let's discuss. Yeah, and that's absolutely. basically what you do, right? I mean, yeah. So here's kind of what I'm going to recommend tomorrow, and 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 you know, we'll get Mike's feedback and Matt's feedback and the folks on the HR side. I think I think what we do is we start with a kind of a town hall meeting where I'll set up a WebEx and I'll kind of share with them what I just shared with you folks, mm -hmm. you know, and let the, the union reps attend and say, this is kind of why we're doing it. And we'll share with you the information that drove the savings assumptions. Um, and we want to get your feedback and we want you to kind of weigh in, right? Um, and then it starts there. And then you yeah. just kind of hope that they look at it and say, yeah, this makes sense. I think a lot of them have some frustrations with what's going on with, with, with Anthem. Yeah. Um, so they, they will appreciate a change. Yeah. You, you hope they will. You would think. You, you would think. You hope. Here's what you'll find though. You know, well, what is the half a million dollars? Well, that's a half a million dollars over three years. So 150, 175,000 a year. It's not going to have a huge material impact on their employee contribution. So you might be talking a couple of bucks here and there. So it's not like this is a windfall for the unions. What you have to convey to them is, hey, we have a fiduciary responsibility to partner with those who are best in class. And we have a fiduciary responsibility to look at the aggregate value of any savings. We're not doing this exercise to save 150,000 over three years, mm -hmm. but the ability to save 500,000 on the fixed costs and maybe an additional 300,000 on the pharmacy claim side. Yeah, that's, we'd be breaching our fiduciary duty if we didn't do it. You didn't now, do it. If you're right. the cop paying 20% of the premium, we're paying 80, you're not going to see a huge windfall, but that doesn't mean we can't produce it, uh, pursue it. And oh, by the way, folks, Anthem hasn't been, you know, a good provider and you felt that burden um, as well. Interesting. Well, you see what happens, right? Yeah. Throw it out there. But again, as you said, Chris, they can't say no. Uh, what they can do is they can grieve it. And there are yeah, some provisions that, that, that I, here, here's where they can shut us down, Greg. There, there are some contracts, I think it's one in particular that says, if we grieve this, no action can be taken until there's a mediation outcome. Okay. And you're talking months down the road, you're done. You're done for it July. Calls it all off. Yep. You're done. Oh, you see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have a solid case. Yeah. I mean, you present the case and, you, and listen, everybody wants to save a couple of bucks. Yeah. And I mean, in, uh, in, in wellness programs, 5% is a, is a small number, but it's a big threshold. Yeah. What, what I say is you look at the 500,000 as a percentage of your fixed cost. It's a big number. It's a big yeah. percentage. Yeah. And if you're, if you're, melding that in with eight, nine million dollars in claims. Well, guess what? You know, 500,000 over three years when we're going to spend 30 million, people are like, that's nothing. And it's not, it's, it is nothing. But when you look at just, all right, we're going to spend 3 million in fixed costs and you're going to pull a half a million dollars out of that. That's 15%. That's 15% yeah. uh, gets my attention. No money, as they yeah. say. Yeah. Oh. So does that beg the question, so are our rates going down? Well, I, th I think, but you know something, uh, you know, for some, yes, for some, no. Like I'm, I, I've got another municipality, Greg, uh, Frank, same thing. They're, they're flatlining their budget this year. They're having a good year. I got another one. They're at 7%. I've got a nonprofit fully insured 6%. I've got another one that I'm wrestling with now, 100 Life Group. 27% increase. So it's all over the place. You know, you're, you're, you're only as good as your most recent 12 months worth of claims in large measure. And if your claims are good, your renewal is good. If your claims are bad, your renewal is bad. Pretty easy. Yeah. So, so the answer is 
we seek stability. We see over the long term. Yep, correct. Okay, I got that. Correct. So that's the plan for tomorrow morning. Mike, is there anything I left out or? No, could you just, if you can briefly, Chris, going back to the stop loss, is it an apples to apples comparison to take Anthem's $74 and compare it? And I don't have the number in front of me of what we're paying uh, CT Prime now. It, it, it is apples to apples. We're paying $103 now. It's apples to apples from the standpoint that, you know, the $150,000 threshold is the same. Um, what falls under that threshold would be all medical and pharmacy claims that breach the pooling level. Um, it's a 1812 contract, which is kind of what we have today. So it is apples to apples. Um, you know, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the back end, not so much what it would cover, but in terms of the, you know, so, so this Anthem is offering the 74, assuming they have the whole program, obviously. Correct. Which makes a difference to them. CT Prime. So CT Prime, for, for people who don't know, uh, this current year and last year did not actually function as a captive. We didn't bear, we, and I say we, you know, because we're a member of CT Prime. We didn't bear any risk the last two years because of the experience that we had in the, in the two or three years prior to that. So we went from, um, from bearing some of the risk in the captive to um, in fiscal 20, a year ago, uh, Anthem fully insured the captive, if you will. So it was just a cooperative uh, purchasing of stop loss, loss insurance among the members of CT Prime. And then likewise, in the year that we're in 21, we have a similar policy with Gerber. So, but on top of that, we have, so I guess, and I can't remember what the captive paid to Anthem two years ago, if that helps or if that's, but, but the, the, the captive also has its own overhead. So on top of what it pays, Gerber this year, Anthem two years, you know, a year ago, on top of what it pays for that coverage, we also have to get an audit done. We have to pay, um, we have to pay Marsh to, to do financial statements and we have attorneys and all of that. So, so that's part of the, the $103 is that overhead, which is something that Anthem doesn't have, right? In the 74, or they can say, uh, you know, they're, they're not saying, but you know, that's 74, they want to make that number look as good as it can look vis-a-vis -vis CT Prime so they can be carrying all their overhead in other parts of the program, other parts of the proposal. Yep. True? Yep. True, true. So you're right. Um, if you peeled off of those ancillary charges, you know, what becomes of that 103? Is it 95? Is it 90? Anthem doesn't have to carry that. That's already baked in. I think the other thing that, you know, I was remiss in mentioning is there is a capital account at the captive. If we ever left, you forfeit your capital account. Now, I don't know what's in that capital account. I'm trying to get that from Gallagher, but say we had 10% in that capital account. Well, you walk away, you're forfeiting 50 grand. I say there was a half a million dollars in the account. Um, there's 50 grand that has to get baked into this calculation, Mike. Um, in a perfect world, John Hardy comes back and says, hey, things are great. We're not expecting big changes. Uh, you know, Weathersfield's adjustment this year is 5% or 7%. It just limits the savings that emerges under Anthem because my concern is, does the union say, hey, your solution right there is just to stay with Anthem and get rid of the captive? Well, that's a solution. Don't get me wrong, but Anthem has done nothing but, you know, feather their own nest over the last two or three years. And, you know, why would we reward bad behavior? We have, you know, a, a commensurate amount of savings by kind of going out and keeping the captive until we're ready to walk away from it, if the evidence supports that. 
and do our own thing with the pharmacy and partner with a carrier that's better. So long way around the barn. Yeah, the, the, you know, we, we'd have to defend why we don't go with Anthem, but I think that's an easy thing to defend. You know, and I would say to the, you know, the police officers, I'd say to the teachers, you tell me how, how good has Anthem been to work with the last six months? You know, these, these aren't isolated incidents. They're somewhat systemic in terms of these problems. Agreed. So, yeah. I mean, I just, the way I look at the stop loss and the difference between $103 and $74 is that some of that is attributable to overhead that again, Anthem can carry in some other part of their, some other aspect of their fixed costs, right? Yeah. And, you know, cause you're not, they're not gonna offer, if, if they were in the business of offering stop loss alone to people and they wanted to buy the business, which is what they wanna do in this case, they still wouldn't be offering that sole product at 74. Yep, 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 um, you're right. So there's, so that to me shrinks the difference. And the other thing that shrinks the difference is that Anthem is trying to buy the business mm -hmm. and that they, they've, you know, it's been very clear some from the beginning of the captive that they want to, you know, see it go away. They want to put it out of, out of business. So they're willing to take a loss. You know, I have to believe, I mean, I don't have any way to know that, but um, except for the difference and the yeah. fact that the captive runs very, you know, we wish we were bigger, but we've got, you know, we've got 10, 10 or 11 members, you know, it's, it's still, you know, enough of a, of a group to, to realize uh, some real savings and, and the overhead, you know, the way it's run is, is fairly lean. Yep. 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 Um, Matt, what's your take on the board of ed side and the unions? And I know, I'm sure you've talked to Trent. He's frustrated with how Anthem's handled things, but you know, what's your sense in, in what you've heard? I haven't heard much. It's unfortunate that the unions run the district in this sense and that they are in favor of grievances when they don't like the potential outcome. So we really have to sell it to the major bodies for the Board of Ed to move forward. And you know, folks, here's the thing. We were close last year. We had the teachers on board. We had every bargaining unit on board with the exception of the police. Now, last year was a little different. All we were asking them to do was allow us to go to a new pharmacy provider. Anthem stepped in and triggered a clause and nixed it. So this year's a little bit different, right? You're asking them to make the same commitment, them being the unions on the pharmacy change, but you're now also asking them to make a change on the Anthem side. So we'll see, we'll see what tomorrow yields. So I can do. All right, anything else, Chris? That's all I have folks. That's plenty. Yeah. All right. uh, any other questions for uh, Mr. Monroe? Okay. Other business? I don't see any other business listed. And I will take a uh, motion to withdraw to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, folks. Take it easy, everybody. Have a great night. Good weekend. Thanks. Yeah. Good luck to tomorrow. Good, tomorrow. good luck. All right, guys. Get, have a good night. Sleep tonight. We'll be ready to go. Yeah.